order, please. All right, my name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, there will be a brief announcements period. Second, there will be a, uh, our speaker will do his presentation. Then there will be a uh, question and answer period in which we ask that you answer questions and not make statements. The third part will be our infamous rebuttal period where we'll each get a chance to rebut the speaker on or off topic. At the end, the speaker has the last word. There are two rules at the College of Complexes. One is one, no personal attacks, and the other is one fool at a time. Chris Kruger, organizer, is our, talking about the movement for a people's party. We are working to build a coalition of groups of the left in order to create a new party for working people. Polls show that the large majority of Americans are progressive and want a major new party. They want single-payer health care, free public college, money out of politics, an infrastructure jobs program, a $15 minimum wage, financial regulations, and more. Working people do not feel represented by the Democratic or Republican parties, and after decades of watching the parties turn their backs on them, they understand why they cannot be salvaged. That's why Gallup reports show that almost two out of three Americans are now calling for nature new party, including a greater number of young people and poor people. The country is beyond ready for a nationally viable progressive party. Our interpret field leaders and volunteers across the country are approaching groups and discussing the coalition with them. They are emissaries of the coalition, and one conversation at a time we are bringing groups together for the party that will complete the political revolution and usher in a 21st century progressive era. Let's make history. Let's introduce uh, Chris Kruger. Let's give a round of applause to him. All right. All right. All right. All right. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here in, in probably the nation's most uh, uh, storied uh, free speech forum, the College of Complexes. I'm acutely aware of the, uh, the history of the College of Complexes. It's approaching its uh, septenarian, uh, it's approaching 70 years. Since it was formed in 1950, so it's an honor. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm with the Movement for a People's Party. The Movement for a People's Party is a coalition party of the left. Uh, my name is Chris Kruger. Uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, prior to being an attorney, I was a high school dropout. And prior to being an attorney, I worked in factories drove taxi cabs and delivered pizzas and I spent 16 years as a member of United Auto Workers and in those 16 years I had the privilege of being able to represent working people <laughs> being able to represent working people from diverse backgrounds and from almost every nation in the world workers from the deep south workers who grew up on the south and west side of Chicago workers who were grew up or were born in Puerto Rico or Mexico or Ecuador and uh, or the Middle East. And so I think I was blessed that I had a, a cross-class uh, upbringing. And uh, then I had a union career. I won a couple of union elections. I lost a couple of union elections. And I, uh, I, I went to school and uh, became an attorney at the age of 50. In my last 15 years, my career as an attorney, I've represented people in uh, discrimination in EEO proceedings. I've represented consumers in foreclosures. I've represented over, probably over 300, 400 homeowners in foreclosures in the last 10 years. And I've prosecuted civil rights actions. I've prosecuted. Uh, ballot access laws for the Green Party. I was the uh, lead attorney in a case called Whitney versus WTTW when WTTW refused to let the Green Party candidate debate with the uh, Republican and Democrat candidate for governor of Illinois. So uh, my background put me in a unique uh, place 
when uh, Bernie Sanders, who helped to awaken uh, the left and awaken socialist-minded people, uh, when Bernie Sanders ran in 2016, I think probably with most of the people in this room, uh, I had great hope. I had a great hope and I had a great uh, encouragement that uh, we would really have a change we really Sorry, have a substantive change in our country, in and our I'll country's uh, politic. And we did have some changes. And I uh, voted for Bernie Sanders in the Illinois primary. I campaigned for Bernie Sanders in, in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. We won two out of three. We won Indiana and Wisconsin, actually, in the Democratic primary. Bernie Sanders lost the uh, uh, Illinois primary, 30,000 votes out of, I want to say 2 million, uh, maybe 2 million votes. Bernie lost by 30,000, and one reason he lost is because the Democrats parachuted Bill Clinton into the west side of Chicago, south side of Chicago, and the ministers drove uh, Bill Clinton around and turned out people on the primary day in, um, in 2016. So, uh, when Bernie was defeated, uh, I felt, as a matter of conscience, I couldn't vote for either nominee of the major parties. I can't vote for people who commit war crimes. I can't vote for people who are culpable and vote to commit war crimes. So, I'm frankly a little concerned today because I know this is an intellectual forum. I know the great legacy of the College of Complexes as a, as a free speech intellectual forum. But I'm really speaking more to people's hearts than I am to their heads. Because what we need, we really have plenty of intellect. We need a little more courage. We need a little more uh, intestinal fortitude to challenge uh, the system as it is, and to challenge the, the, the walls that we live within. So I took the I took the decision. I was going to vote for Jill Stein. I voted for Jill Stein. Donald Trump won. You know what? I'm glad I voted for Don, uh, uh, Jill Stein. I, I'm not at all happy that Trump won, but you know what? I'm very happy Hillary Clinton lost. And I will feel that way. Of, hundred years from now, if you ask me, and I was here, I'd tell you the same thing. Because I'm not voting for war crimes, I'm not voting for nuclear armaments, I'm not voting for coups, sanctions, overthrowing democratically elected governments. And I don't care if there's a D next to their name, or an R next to their name, or an L next to their name. So, after Bernie lost, Bernie did what some people predicted he would do. He told us to vote for Hillary Clinton. You want soup? A lot of people on the left are Good mad at Bernie for telling us to vote for Hillary Clinton. You know what I told those people? <laughs> I said, just because Bernie tells you to do it, you don't have to do it. Bernie's a sitting United States Senator. Bernie has to do it. I don't. And I didn't. And I say the same thing now. So Bernie Sanders does what Bernie Sanders has to do as a sitting United States Senator who has to govern, who has to legislate, who has to reach compromise with Republicans and corporate Democrats. Just because he does it doesn't mean I got to do it and doesn't mean you got to do it. So I'm planning on voting for Bernie in a primary in all likelihood and then if I don't get a non war candidate. If I get Elizabeth Warren, I'm going to vote the Green Party again. If Howie Hawkins is on the ballot, I certainly hope he is. So that's my background. Uh, say a bit more about my background. I voted for Jill Stein in 2012. And I voted for Jill Stein in 2012 because I already, in my mind, determined that Barack Obama I avoid the good guy, bad guy fallacy, because we all know it's a fallacy. Because we all know that within ourselves, there's good things, there's bad things. Every person in this room done good things and bad things. 
what I learned was that Barack Obama, whether he was the best guy in the whole world, he could not do what he promised to do. And the reason he couldn't do what he promised to do was because of the legitimacy of the two-party system. And there's no escape hatch. And when they sit you down, when you're elected president of the United States, they sit you down and say, Mr. President, this is what you can do. This is what you can't do. You can't have a public option this time. Maybe next time we'll get a public option. You can't avoid that war in Libya. Maybe next time we won't have a war in Libya. So Obama good, Obama bad. I'm not even worried about it. I voted for Stein in 12. I voted for Stein in 16. I'm going to vote for Bernie in a primary. So we're in a transitory stage, hopefully. Let's hope we're in a transitory stage. Because we can't live in this two-party system. We're going to burn up the earth. We're going to have a nuclear accident or a nuclear holocaust. We're going to have two generations. Now we're on our second generation <coughs> of student debtor slaves, of young people who are 40, 60, 80, $100,000 in debt <coughs> for nothing, for jobs that don't exist, who are trained for a middle class that doesn't exist. Okay, I need so, a minute. Background of People's Party, when mm. Bernie was defeated, and at the culmination of, uh, of uh, his run, he formed a group, Our Revolution. Everybody in this room heard of Our Revolution? Right? Our Revolution is, is, a, is a 501 C3, and I should be an attorney, I should know if it's a 501 or 503, I, I don't know. But he formed a PAC, and Bernie made his campaign manager the head of that PAC, and that caused the schism within the Bernie volunteers. And a number of Bernie volunteers broke away and said, this is going to be an on-ramp to the Democratic Party. This is going to be an on-ramp to all the, all the cheating that the Democrats did to Bernie Sanders and his voters, all the, you know, turning off the mic, all the other, all the, all the uh, ballot access tricks they did to Bernie voters, and so we're going to break from our revolution. We're going to break essentially from the Democratic Party. They formed a group called the Draft Bernie, Draft Bernie Movement. Draft Bernie for a, for a People's Party was founded by the director of my outfit, the Movement for a People's Party. His name is Nick Branya, B-R-A-N-A, -A. and he had he was an advisor to Bernie's campaign. He was the main liaison between Bernie's campaign and the superdelegates. And he learned just how deep the corruption in the Democratic Party is, and just how much the Democratic Party is controlled by billionaire oligarchs, and just how much the Bur uh, Democratic Party will, will stoop to any depth of deception and lies to cheat a genuine socialist-minded person, or any genuine, I would say, social democrat. And so the movement, the uh, uh, draft Bernie movement was started, and when mean? Bernie declined uh, <coughs> the invitation to run as an independent, and frankly, as an attorney, I'm not even sure if Bernie could legally run as an independent once he had run into the Democratic primary, so I'm, un I'm unclear if draft Bernie ever had a, a uh, a legitimate uh, shot. But in any case, Bernie, who is 78 years old, he runs as a Democrat. I don't hold that against Bernie. I love Bernie. I'm going to vote for Bernie. But I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to start making my own way. And what we're asking, what we're proposing, is that we honor all the groups of the left. I'm a member of the Green Party. Represent a Green Party in, in uh, civil rights uh, litigation. Remember at DSA. I love the DSA. I love their energy. I love their youthful uh, enthusiasm. Got some issues with uh, some of their approaches to uh, speech. But I love them. I'm a member. Other groups I support, uh, very uh, supportive of. 
Poor, Poor People's Campaign. That's a organization headed by the Reverend William Barber. It's uh, Reverend Barber was originally a uh, the head of the North Carolina NAACP. He was the uh, initiator of a uh, thing called Moral Mondays, which was a, uh, a movement in that region that brought people together and who opposes poverty on a moral basis, on the basis of some amount of uh, re religiosity. That this is wrong to have the level of poverty we have in the United States. So Poor People's Campaign, DSA, Green Party, we certainly got plenty of intellect we got plenty of leadership. What we need is to bring all these groups into coalitions and give all these groups uh, a space and give politicians a space. See, when politicians do bad stuff, I know it's the people. We create the room for Bernie. We create the room for politicians to make courageous decisions instead of caving in to special interests. So we got to be courageous. We got to say, I'm not voting for this person. I'm not voting against my interest. I'm not voting uh, against my values. And if the bad guy wins, let, let the bad guy win. Because what we've seen as uh, since the Clintons, since Bill Clinton's election, Democrats had a strategy to capture the center. The, the motto of the Democratic Leadership Caucus was the Democrats would come back from Reagan and the, and the labor hating and poor people hating uh, policies of Reagan, and they would capture the center, and that's how they would do it. And they say, well, we have to do it because, you know, in the border states, we have to win. We have to head that. In. So they <clears throat> nominated a border state politician. They captured the center. And then what did Clinton? What did the Clintons do? I'm sorry, my notes. The Clintons did all the stuff that Reagan wanted to do, but he couldn't do it because he's wearing a, a the Greek mask. He's wearing an ugly one. Bill Clinton's wearing a pretty one in terms of the Greek mask. So Clinton really and the DLC really invented neoliberalism as we know it. They passed welfare reform. That punished black women, largely black women, poor women, kicked hundreds of thousands of children off of, off of support, impoverished millions of people. They passed the omnibus crime bill, which put the fathers of a lot of these people in jail. Created mass incarceration, three strikes, locking people up for nonviolent drug offenses. They repealed the Glass Steagall Act. They gave Wall Street a free pass, casino capitalism. They passed NAFTA. By doing so, they exported tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. I know you folks know this, but just putting it in context, just setting it up for you. They passed NAFTA. At the 11th hour, almost at 11.59 on Bill Clinton's last day in August, he signed a bill which deregulated the derivatives trade. And what it did is all the derivatives and, and crazy um, uh, hedge fund and uh, credit default swap speculating, what the bill did was put this Wall Street madness outside the purview of the SEC and outside the uh, regulation of the Securities Exchange Act. That was like on the last day Bill Clinton was in office. He gave Wall Street a big gift. And probably worst of all, although very, a little more subtle, Bill Clinton signed the Telecom Deregulation Act. <laughs> the Telecom Deregulation Act is affecting all of us on a daily and hourly basis because instead of having 250 newspapers in the United States, with 250 ownership groups, hundreds of telev uh, television stations with hundreds of owners, radio stations with family, little radio stations. Linda Baines Johnson's family owned a radio station in Texas. 
was a family business. Instead now, we have six capitalist monopolies that control everything we see, everything we hear, everything we read about, everything we hear in passing in conversation, unless you really go out of your way to search for independent media. And I urge you to go out of your way to search for independent media. And if you cross some crazy guy while you're looking for it, just, just keep going. Just keep looking. Uh, one of the main benefits I had from 2016 from Bernie was that the lies about Bernie were so egregious. I said, I cannot, I can't listen <coughs> to MSNBC, CNN, ABC, CBS, and even PBS, which I bet everybody loved at some point in this room. I love PBS, and even they succumbed to a kind of programming by uh, the elites, by the donor class, by the oligarchs, and we know, and Bernie says daily, there's three people in half the country. That's a fact. It sounds it's almost too much to process. So I found a lot of independent media on YouTube, iPod, uh, podcasts, etc. I urge you, I urge you to really go out and, and, and kind of push your push your comfort in terms of media. So the movement for a people's party. I believe we have between 40,000 and 60,000 Facebook followers. Um, let's take a look at our platform. And it's very, it's very similar to what I call a social democratic platform. They have a, an economic bill of rights. You, mean, you may have seen Michael Moore uh, in the movie um, Fahrenheit 9-11, was it? Where he showed uh, Roosevelt reading his, his economic bill of rights. Roosevelt didn't live to see, to have a chance to implement it. Yeah. Roosevelt talked about an economic bill of rights. Basically, full employment, basically a full employment guarantee. Full employment by the government. They support that. I'm going to put these items up for you so you can glance at them. But we know strong unions, strong unions and workplace democracy. Barack Obama said he was going to get us card check. Card check, if you don't know, ladies and gentlemen. The, the, the NLRB is a federal agency that certifies labor unions. They do it by holding elections in workplaces. The majority of the workers vote for the union. Workplaces unionized. The majority of workers vote against the union for not unions. Management attorneys so corrupted the, not only the election process, and they did it by firing union activists, tying them up in court for years, and then giving them $5,000 to vote. Away. And that's how they de they, they de unionized entire huge swaths. And so people on the south and west side of Chicago, people in the suburbs, people in the middle class and lower middle class, plus tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs, of jobs that would give them and their, their, their children a shot at, at a middle class life. So Obama promised our, us card check, and card check, they don't have it in an LRB election. The card check, the worker signs a card, the union collects 51, percent of cards the place is really nice. You don't have management attorneys coming in, firing everybody, decertifying uh, decertifying the union. Uh, you have you have stronger uh, labor. Obama promised that. Modernize our infrastructure, a fair tax code. We have uh, a number of endorsers. And I, I ask you all to go to our website, it's peoplesparty.org. Please go, please subscribe to it. Please give us your name. We won't spam you too much. We'll send you an email, maybe as often as, as, as the Greens will, will send you an email, or DSA sends you an email. And you can stay up with what we're doing. We're very deep in the climate protests this last week. We have over eight or ten organizations endorsing us, including the Extinction Rebellion, 
other other of these climate groups. We have a, a group that recently joined our coalition called Move to Amend. And Move to Amend is a uh, organization to uh, amend the U.S. Constitution to overturn uh, Citizens United. And of course, Citizens United is a case that held that corporations and the, the oligarch class can donate unlimited amounts of money both to individual candidates and to tax that's called dark money. That's when organizations are not supposed to work directly with candidates, but they're often, they're found that they do work directly with candidates. In the case of Scott Walker in Wisconsin, for example. So, uh, move to amend a good outfit that's to amend the uh, Constitution to overturn Citizens United. That goes back to a line of cases called Buckley versus Vallejo, by the way. And the point of it is that if you control someone's ability to spend money, you control someone's speech. What if I want to buy a billboard out there and they tell me, no, you can only spend so much to buy a billboard, that's your, and I say that's my speech. Well, that might be true for me. It's not true for General Motors. It's not true for Jeff Bezos. It's not true for Amazon. So we want to overturn this idea that money somehow equals speech. Uh, that's moved to a man. That's Citizens United. Why is it impossible to reform the Democratic Party? And why is it both, why is it reactionary and, and a waste of time? We're constantly given hope. When we see the election of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, we're given hope that there's something that can happen in the Democratic Party. When Cortez defeated uh, Crowley, a guy who was arguably third in line for Speaker of the House. So that was a big deal. We have these two lovely uh, uh, Muslim ladies, Tlaib and Omar, and they're terrific, and their voices need to be heard, and I, and I endorse their voices. But the fact is, a week after these people were sworn in, they're voting for Nancy Pelosi to be Speaker of the House. AOC votes for Nancy Pelosi to be Speaker of the House. And you know why she voted for Nancy Pelosi? Because they had a guy to the right of Pelosi running. So then it's like, oh, we got to vote for Pelosi. The lesser of two evils. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> lesser of two evils sound familiar? So that's why, as hard as painful as it is, we have to sever our ties to the Democratic Party. And if that means writing in somebody, if that means voting green, or that means voting to create a new party. And a movement for a people's party. It's going to do that. We're going to do it district by district. We're going to do it state by state. We're going to do it in harmony with our uh, sister and brother organizations of the left. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party have an unbroken continuum since Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, two terms. Bush the elder, you've got, uh, help me, Clinton, two terms, Bush Jr., two terms. Obama, Trump, two terms. you have an unbroken <laughs> continuum of foreign policy, of overthrow, of sanctions, of commercialized murder. Every president since Bill Clinton has been a war criminal. First thing Obama said when he was elected, we're not prosecuting Bush. Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, you all get a pass. Torture, you torture guys, all get a pass. We have dragged our country and our country's uh, standing in the world through, through the mud. We have to sever our ties to these parties at all costs. There's an unbroken, while, and, and while there's an unbroken continuum, of military of empire. So what happened? So what happened to the Roman Empire? It extended so far, 
Supply money's got so far. All the money was spent on war. All the money was spent taxing the people. What happened in the Roman Empire? The collapse. We have to be one step ahead of the collapse of this empire. And we have to do it by forming, severing our ties with Democrats and forming the party. An unbroken continuum. 89 senators voted for Trump's war budget. And how many people in this room know that the Democrats added to Trump's budget? Everybody know that? Democrats added billions of dollars to Trump's war budget. Gave him more money than he wanted for, but the Democrats will tell you Trump is nuts. Well, then why are they giving him 30, 30 more billion dollars to kill people with? So, the history of Democratic betrayal of, of the poor and the black and the oppressed goes way back. Let's talk about Han uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Folks remember Han Fannie Lou Hamer? She was, a, she was the chairperson of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And the people, the voters in Mississippi, elected a virtually all black delegation to the 1964 Democratic Convention. It came, the white separatists held their own, held their own election and nominated their own people. And they both went to a convention, I believe in Lank City. Yeah. And they went to Atlantic City and the, uh, they would not see the Mississippi Democrats. It's a segregationist party. You have, you have no guilt. Talk about guilt to leave the Democratic Party. It's a segregationist party. It was a party of the Ku Klux Klan. It's a party of Hiroshima. Dropped an atomic bomb, killed 40,000 innocent people. <laughs> So we got two war criminal parties, and we need to have the courage. And everybody in this room, anybody in this room, anyone else voted for Joe Stein and Trump won, you did the right thing. I want you to know that. And you do the right thing next time by, by not voting for these, these criminal oligarch parties. So we have to be uh, vigilant and guard against this false hope. Uh, the thing I was reading recently, there's a lot of talk about, there's a lot of research into the brain, into the human brain. There's a lot of research because of the Alzheimer's, various uh, diseases of the brain, maladies of the brain. And they're learning about different sections. Under your Cerebral cortex is a thing called the limbic system. The limbic system is also called your lizard brain. Okay? And so when we vote, when we take political stances based on how we feel, we're not being strategic. We're using our emotions. We're using our lizard brain. When we vote for one war criminal who looks better in a suit, like Barack them vote for another war criminal like Trump. <laughs> Although I gotta say, uh, Hillary was an accomplished war criminal, a seasoned war criminal, a veteran war criminal. Trump's an aspiring war criminal. Okay? Trump didn't vote for the Iraq war. Trump didn't vote for NAFTA. Trump did not start invent racism. So when the Democratic Party tries to flip this, we need to really be strategic and say, what are we going to do? Are we going to go, are we going to go uh, Groundhog Day? I love Bill Murray. My girlfriend actually lived down the street from Bill Murray's mother in, in Wilmette. But uh, we can't have this Groundhog Day from the time of Fannie Lou Hamer. Or let's talk about the Democratic Convention. Pete, you, you guys all remember the 60th Convention. And in response to that, a few years later, that's how we got super delegates. Uh, and isn't it just um, an irony and really kind of shameful that we, 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 our party, not my party, Democrat party, has super delegates 
to prevent democracy from happening. Republicans don't need superdelegates. Why is that? Republicans manage to do just fine without superdelegates, but we need superdelegates. Democrats need superdelegates. And we put a lot of energy into the DNC reform, put a lot of energy, want to get that uh, Ellison, young, he would have been the first Muslim head of the DNC, want to get Keith Ellison elected to the DNC. <clears throat> Don't want to call up Barack, so we can't have that. I believe it's uh, Jaime Saban. Jaime Saban called up Barack, so we can't have this guy as head of the DNC. So now you've got Tom Perez at head of the DNC. And then we put a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, like Norm Solomon. I love Norm Solomon. He's beautiful. I love all the people that voted for Bernie. I'm going to vote for Bernie. I want to be real clear about that. But I got no illusions voting for Bernie. Okay. So all these good people put a lot of work into reforming the DNC. What they got was one ballot without superdelegates. What did the donor class do? They ran 20 people for president. No one's going to get 51% on the first ballot. Liz Warren, an aspiring war criminal, not a seasoned war criminal, but she's working at it. She votes for every budget. She votes for every military budget. She votes for whatever APAC tells her to vote for. She's an aspiring war criminal. And so she's going to split it. And the superdelegates are either going to pick her or Biden. They may pick her because Biden is getting ready to he's like drooling into a cup and stuff. <laughs> so President Warren is not going to transform society. President Warren is not going to have a plan. Plans are not going to pass. President Warren is a nice Midwestern lady, Republican, law professor. That reminds me of Sheila Bear. She was a moderate, moderate Republican. We used to have moderate Republicans. President Warren is not going to be the answer. She's not just like Bernie. You're going to hear all your, your little neoliberal friends. And I'm not hating on neoliberals. I'm not hating on the professional class. But they are the biggest danger. They are the most dangerous people, the most thoughtless people. The most you talk about free speech, they are the most constrained in their thinking class. To me, they're far more dangerous than Trump's pickup driving, gun toting, all those guys. They're they're a lot more dangerous because they believe they believe what they hear on CNN and MSNBC. So please look at uh, peoplesparty.org. Please. Uh, let us communicate with you, communicate with us. We want to establish a third party of the 21st century. Got a lot of youthful enthusiasm from the Bernie campaign. And it's continuing. Our leadership is rooted in this. Our leadership is um, kind of, kind of uh, second nature. Our leadership is uh, is uh, very tech savvy. Our leadership understands the global movements. We have uh, global movements now all over the world, where parties have come into existence and elected people at high levels, up to and including president, in two and four year time segments. So this idea that's going to take the rest of your life and the rest of your kids' life. Um, things are changing, things are dynamic. We have a, a generation of people who are sick and tired of the corruption, they're sick and tired of being threatened by the destruction of the planet, they're sick and tired of their, of their student debt, and they're energized, and they, uh, they need our support, they need our, uh, our help. That, that about wraps it up for me. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Uh, and
and any any questions you have, I'll try my best. All right. Very good. All right, stay up there to take questions. All right, we need a, if somebody wants to moderate, go ahead. Moderation and all things. All right, let me uh, start out with the first question. You know, you said everything that you're against. You've talked a little bit about why we need to join this party, but you never really went into what you stood for and how you're going to make the change. There is, a, there is an extensive... So what happens nowadays is you, you ask a question, I'll say, you know, go to the support page. Go, go to the page and, and, and read. It's a platform, and that's the interesting thing about the left. People's Party platform, sorry, very similar to Greens, very similar to Bernie's, very similar to PSL. Anybody heard of PSL, Party for Socialism? in, in uh, Liberty, they're out of Baltimore. There's 200 organizations of the left. There's 200 social, social Democrat, I would call it social Democrat organizations. They all want to raise minimum wage. They all want to liberalize labor laws, make it easier to unionize. They all want to have free college to either to the uh, um, junior, two year or four year level at public schools. They all want to have Medicare for all. Um, recent step back was the Working Families Party who endorsed Liz Warren last week. So if you hear, if you get anybody here get mail from Working Families Party, well, good, you're lucky. You're lucky. But it's a party from New York. They've run some independent candidates, and uh, they shocked everybody. They they endorsed Bernie in 2016. They shocked everybody by endorsing Warren. And then when they looked at it, they found out that the Working Families Party. When they endorse someone, the members get half the votes, and then the organizers get half the votes. So it's kind of like super delegates. So isn't that so? That was a big disappointment. With it. But to answer Tim's question, I would say it's a social democratic platform. It is I don't think exactly a carbon copy or anti-war. Well, we go a step farther than Bernie. Because we uh, we support uh, Assange, we support Snowden, we support Manning, we support whistleblowers. We don't like the CIA, we don't like the NSA, we don't like the FBI. So, um, so that's the platform. You go to the website. I, I I invite you to go to the website and look at it. It's uh it's a it's a social democratic platform. Yes. Okay, who's? If the third party candidates don't win, left with the Democrat and Republican, how does not voting for either one of them foster your cause? Because the world is not going to end in the next four years. And so because the world's not going to end in the next four years, you can live with a certain amount of discomfort and again, I submit that our discomfort is more uh, a product of our limbic system than of our rational system. So Trump is ugly. Trump says bad stuff. Trump says bad stuff about Mexicans and criminals or rapists. He says stuff that's repugnant. So when he bombs Syria, actually when he bombs Syria, it's because the Democrats made him bomb Syria. When he gassed, when he staged the gas attack, they had Trump bomb Syria. And then they said, oh, he's presidential now. He bombed Syria. So in my opinion, domestic politics is a very elaborate, orchestrated theater. And it really is pretty far removed from reality. So I say, let them lose. Let them lose until they give the left Either they give us Medicare that we should for all that we should have had. Harry Truman wanted wanted uh, free medical. So did Hillary Clinton. Well, oh, bullshit. what Hillary Clinton wanted to do was murder thousands of innocent women and children in Libya, in Syria, in Afghanistan. She overthrew the government of Honduras. It's hard to find a more despicable person than Hillary Clinton, but. I don't hold it personal because I'm over personals now. I just have ideas. 
Hillary Clinton, if I believed in personalities, would be one of the most despicable. But I don't think it's her. I think she's a, I think she's a victim of her uh, circumstances. Okay. Okay. She's a war criminal. Hillary Clinton is a war criminal. Oh. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, this, it, the, what I got out of this is like the Democratic National Committee sets this platform up and they decide how it's going to be. It doesn't matter who runs or who we vote for, but the, the DNC is the one that, that pretty much decides what the puppet's going to do. Yeah, exactly. There's a donor class. And the donor, donor class, class runs the DNC? The donor class, there's a spigot. Thank you. Okay. And one spigot, they turn it off, and another one, they turn it on. They got one spigot goes to the DNC, they got one spigot goes to, uh, uh, you know, Adelson, Sheldon Adelson, or Mercer, or these other guys. That spigot goes to Trump, and then you got um, the I Democrats see. have their own donor spigot. So until you choke these donors, you cannot vote for a candidate that accepts donor money, corporate donor money. You cannot vote for a candidate that accepts PAC money. You just have to find somebody. You gotta find somebody. You gotta find somebody. We have to create a space. But splintering the popular vote is simply to gonna give it to space. the other the other um, I understand. No one's I'm not saying it's easy. The, my, but my, the GOP is doing the same thing, right? I mean, who's ever running Trump? Well, of course. What choice do they have? And they, how are you going to get out of it if you if you, you can't get out of it by having the moral persuasion that we are going to reject candidates that take corporate money. We're just not going to vote for them. And if we got to vote for, if we vote for Bernie, well, if you can't do it, you can't I mean, do it, ma'am. I'm, I'm fine with it. Mean, I mean, the point is, if you don't vote for them, um, but Trump wins. Well, so Trump won. So now what happened are, what today? What those people are going to win? What happened the day after Trump won? Okay. I think the sun came up Stop over the lake. Stop marking Thailand. the bomb. Yeah. 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 Well, one question is, you know, as a party, don't you have to kind of register as a party or something? I mean, there's a Those are the ballot legal, access laws. Yeah, those. Yeah. Have you tried to do that? Just or? collect signatures. It's like uh, Have you done Charles that? is collecting signatures mm -hmm. for uh, for the Green Party uh, Metropolitan Sanitary District. So mm -hmm. we want to uh, form a coalition of, of right. people like the uh, like the Green Party, like the Working Families Party, who's a lot of dissolution members right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's really not a choice. Here's the thing: it's not a choice. Sure. It's it's a, it's mandatory. It's a survival strategy. You're not going to survive with this climate stuff and this other stuff. I don't know if you're a big climate <coughs> person or not. Whether you're a big climate <coughs> person or you're a big labor union person, it's a survival strategy because now we've become a third world country. We're Rome. We can't we can't fix the potholes in the road, but we're, we we can buy Raytheon uh, missiles. <laughs> my, uh, my bigger, I guess, deeper question is like I've thought of running as a Republican to split the Republicans. I come from that family and I know they're doing the same thing. It seems to go to like APAC and the NRA. It's undue influence. Can't we fight it legally, re-regulate it, put in honest services laws, try to deal with this through the regulations, but I think through politics we're losing and the, people, the planet is going to start that's great, dying. That's a great comment, great question. Running as a Republican is a strategic, is strategic thinking, and I applaud it. Mm -hmm. I applaud it. Running as a Republican is strategic thinking, and I applaud it. Here's the thing, and Bernie says it because Bernie has lived it. It comes from the ground up. You can't look up to Mr. Representative to pass other laws, Mr. Lawyer to beat up the bad guys like your big brother on a playground. We have to do this. And we have to do it as a survival strategy. And if okay, this idea that the bad guy wins is so exaggerated. It's so much predicated on again. Remember the Telecom Act. Remember that you've got five monopolies telling you how to think and what to think. And that, that's don't let that upset you. But that wasn't just five monopolies to tell you how to think. It was the contract with America. And you've got you've got five. Companies tell you how to think DNC and one Fox.
telling you how to think RNC. So, you know, if you root no, for the underdog, you, you, you look at Fox. The contract with America, New Gingrich was behind both of them. Right, and power that law. I powered a new Gingrich because he did a lot of reform that was necessary. Oh. He was behind the whole contract. Oh. The Clinton, what, what did all those bad things? It wasn't well, Clinton. I mean, that's in the past. We, we got to go forward. And we got to go forward. The Republicans are. We got to go forward. And more the more poor party. people have become right. out of our oh. dire poverty oh. under the last yeah. 20 years. I can't make a whole conversation. All right. Okay. Uh, your, your speech is uh, very down, very down. <coughs> not uplifting. A person want to build a park and come here. You got to be uplifting, right? And nothing you say, they're not uplifting. You're saying me, hey, there is paradise there, and this guy will take me. What's up? What's going on? Well, I think the uplifting thing is that there are people who are willing to break from the past. There's people willing to have a, a new paradigm, create their own paradigm. There's people that are not rooted in, in, in the past. So, yeah, unfortunately, we are talking about the destruction of the old and a rebirth. So I take that, that criticism as constructive, and um, I, can, I can see your perception. It's hard to glean a lot of good news when you have two parties that are both 89 United States Senators voting for $730 billion uh, war budget. So you got to be real, but I think the hope is in the youth. The hope is in the young people that are not afraid to defy convention. They're not afraid to, uh, to fight. Uh, and, and, and as we were, you know. That, you don't believe anything? Hey, huh? look at the kids, you know, they are coming up. Come on. That's going on for ages. I mean, you know, that good is going on for it. As long as we, human beings are here. Well, it doesn't work. Know, we, we did have a third party in this country. We did have a successful third party movement. And that movement was the Republican Party. They were formed in, uh, in a little schoolhouse in Wisconsin, 14 people. Help me out, what's the, what's the town of Wisconsin? What's the Green. 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 No, one guy had it right. Green. 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 Go ahead, Ripon. David. Riffin. Riffin. Yeah. Riffin, Wisconsin. And they, they weren't perfect, but they did a few good things. They ended slavery. They fought the Civil War. They were a party of the abolitionists. And they were a third party. And during Reconstruction, there were the radical Republicans. They helped elect the, fir the only, the first and only majority black uh, legislat le legislation, uh, legislatures in the uh, state. So the Republicans were a third party. Let's remember that. We had a thing called a Whig Party, a Democratic Party, and we had a radical uh, party, I believe, called the Liberty Party. They were radical abolitionists weren't afraid to die for their beliefs. Well, I can't, I can't say if I have the courage to die for my belief. I'm pretty comfortable. I've lived a pretty good uh, middle class lifestyle. But I do have the courage to not vote for either Democrat or Republican. Both of them are culpable in, in very evil, very evil things. Okay. Yes, sir. This is still a center right country. Trump got a 63 million votes in the last election. Do you really think you got enough progressives? People look down on progressives. They're radical. Yeah. Here's what I think. Another very good question. The elites, the oligarch class, the donor class, they're dependent on a 49-51 split. And their discourse through the media that they control, that is pounded into every person's brain 24-7 in this country, MSNBC, CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, and then Fox, all by itself. You kind of feel sorry for the right wing guys. They only get one media monopoly. The left gets like seven media monopolies. So it's pounded into you that there's a 51 49 split. In reality, 80% of the people in the United States are against these wars. A lot of them 
are Republicans with pickup trucks. <laughs> they're against these wars. And they're against these wars because they've served in them. They've died in them. Their family members have died in them, sacrificed in them. And they know how bad they are. 80% of the people in this country are for Medicare for all. And a lot of them are Republicans. And you know why? Because they've had people uh, uh, die of curable diseases. They have people who can't go to the doctor. Every time I go to the country, which is pretty rough, and I'm talking about rural Wisconsin, used to go more in rural Missouri, you go to the coffee shop, you can leave in the door of the coffee shop, you say, Tommy Jones benefit, Tommy's got liver cancer, and he can't afford it, so we're having a potluck dinner, and my joke used to be, I, I put a picture, I'd redact the names, I put a picture on my on my Facebook, Twitter post, whatever, it's a Republican health care. Okay, and it's a potluck dinner. So, 80% support a robust safety net. 80% support public education free. We got public education free to grade 12. That used to be a radical idea. But he wants to make it to the four-year college. The 51-49 split is an artifice, and it's created by having a number of issues that are what I call inbounds. You know, you play football, you got inbounds and out of bounds. There's some stuff is inbounds, some's out of bounds. What's inbounds? Abortion is inbounds. Because my base likes it, your base hates it, we agree. We'll split it right down the middle. Guns are inbounds. Because guns, my base likes guns. They live in a country, they carry guns, they go shoot rabbits or whatever, deer or whatever, they like guns. Your, your constituency hate guns. We'll split it right down the middle. Supreme Court. Remember how the most important thing in the world was how we were supposed to vote Democrat to save the Supreme Court. And then Obama didn't fight for his guy. Then they let Kavanaugh, they, they, they complained about, uh, whined about Kavanaugh, but they let Kavanaugh in. The Republicans got one guy after another, but that's why you voted Democrat, was to save the Supreme Court. Remember? That was the most important thing in the world. But that's in bounds. What's out of bounds, meaning that the media will not elevate it, is the problems of the working poor, the problems of health care. See, only because of Bernie are we even talking about health care. And they'll try to pass a, a, a phony, uh, inferior version of Medicare for all. But um, in, in truth, there's enough progressives, plus there's enough anti-war people on the right and left there's enough anti-war people of the right and left. There's enough pro-health care people. There's enough people who support these ideas. As we're saying, when we poll people, we get two-thirds and say, yeah, I'd like to have a new party. But we have to do it. We can't wait for elites to do it. The professional classes are going to do it for us. The attorneys aren't going to do us, do us any favors. The courts aren't going to do you any favors. The courts are, are now as um, unfortunately as bad as the other two branches of government. But, but the, the truth is, I think, sir, to answer your question, the right and left, the terminology of the right and left has less and less utility as time progresses. It's really, are you for the wars or are you against the wars? Who sponsored the, uh, who sponsored the anti-Yemen, the vote on Yemen? You know who sponsored the vote on Bernie. Yemen? Bernie, Mike Lee, a far-right Republican from Utah, and Rand Paul. Libertarians think that we shouldn't have wars because we should mind our own business. Lefties think we shouldn't have wars because they kill innocent people and they're bad, etc. Does it matter if we all oppose war. If 80% of us oppose war, does it matter? So I think that the, 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 we got to rework the, additional, the continuum of right to left because it really is not, it's not serving our, our purposes. It's serving the elite's purpose because they say, well, this is right wing stuff. You don't listen to him. He's right wing guy. This is left wing stuff. You don't listen to him. Charles? All right. Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. Chris. You gave us uh, a whole bunch of examples why the Democrats have um, failed us. But we're, next week we're going to talk about a Democratic initiative. 
HR1, which kind of the Democrats would be good. And there's a problem when you argue by example, is that for every example you give, there's a counterexample. And you never arrive at the truth. So just as you said there were bad pieces of legislation that hurt the working men, don't you think the Wagner Act, and I worked for 35 years under something called the Civil Service Reform Act, which was signed by Carter. Well, I don't have too bad thing to say about the Democrats. Well, well, I mean, I'm pretty sure that our, our last point was about Roosevelt's vision of an economic bill of rights. And I know a little bit about the Wagner Act because I worked at the NLRB for a short time and I was at UW uh, President of Local Union for a little bit of time. Um, so yes, we realize the achievements of the people. So it's the people's achievements. It's really not the politicians' achievements. It's the people's achievements. So the people, so the people used the Democratic Party as an instrumentality for their achievements. Because see, like Bernie, I know it starts at the bottom, not the top. And I'm telling this audience, or I'm urging, Attempt to persuade us that the Democratic vehicle, uh, Party is not the vehicle for working people. The working people told you that last November. Working people spoke very clearly last November. They told you that they don't think the Democratic Party is a vehicle uh, for them. So let's remember that. Um, right. I'm believing less and less in leaders, less and less in personalities, and more and more in ideas. And I think the war is, is, has evolved to my highest sense of right, the most important issue. I don't care if the guy telling me the war is bad as a libertarian who voted for Ron Paul, or the guy telling me that uh, against war as a communist, or the CPUSA, voted for, uh, who's the guy that ran 20 times for the CPUSA? I, I don't care if he's CPUSA, or if he's a uh, libertarian. Um, so, so, yeah, uh, not into labels, not into personality. I say the workers persuaded Roosevelt to pass the Wagner Act. That's right. The workers persuaded him and said, if we don't pass the Wagner Act, we're going to have a ton of, a load of trouble. And so Roosevelt saved capitalism. So there was good and bad in everything. There was good and bad in everything, saving capitalism. Okay. I'd like to know, wouldn't a lot of these problems be, about, be, be taken care of by term limits? I'd like to get your, your perspective on those. It solves nothing. I think it's, it's um, there's a term, it may be Mao Zedong, I'm not sure, it's left in form, right in essence. The term, term limits is kind of left in form, right in essence. What if you get a really good guy? What if you get a really good guy in there? And he gets, he gets eight years. We got term limits for President of the United States. I think that's enough. If you get a really good guy in there, you don't want to turn on it. And you get a really bad guy in there, you need to have the guts and the, and the, and the energy and the enthusiasm. Get out and get rid of that bad guy. And go register some people. Go go knock on some doors. Go use some shoe leather and get rid of that bad guy. So no, term limits is, is a right wing. Term, term, term limits is, is reactionary to me. Yes, me can we, can oh, I'm sorry, he's calling on you. I'm sorry. My okay, we're trying to move around the room here. First off, I want question. to say I learned a lot more tonight than I thought I would. Now, well, there's you. a growing movement here in Chicago led by city council members for the city of Chicago to take over ComEd. It would be the first. There are cities around the country where the electric grid is owned by the public, but it's never gone private to public. What do you think about this movement here in Chicago? for the city to democratize ComEd in, in other cities. What do you think about a movement like that? You know, the, the, uh, the young people who I, who I deal with in, in the movement for a People's Party use the term granular to know the details. I don't know the details of it, but I'll say this. It, it works for Winnetka. Winnetka owns their power plant. I didn't know that. Winnetka owns their power plant. They got socialism there up there in Winnetka. <laughs> so um, I see nothing wrong. You know, farmers own co-ops all over the country. There's county uh, 
co-ops that generate electricity. I don't think there's anything in it, especially when we know that Commonwealth has the highest bills in the nation, highest electric. When they built the nuclear, and you folks will remember, I think, a lot of you, when they built the nuclear plants, they say, the electricity is going to be so cheap, they're not even going to have a meter. They're not even going to use a meter, that's how cheap electric's going to be. So yeah, I, I say give them a shot. I, I try that. I vote for that. Yeah, yeah. You got a question over here? Um, yeah, can we go online and find out what the, um, what did you call them? The uh, the donor class has they they've got a slate someplace. This is what we're gonna this is what we're gonna do, and who's ever gonna who's ever gonna be our puppet has to do it. Can we go find out what's on the list? Oh uh, yeah, I mean when I use the donor class, I'm just talking about people with sufficient means that they donate to politicians, and they are really the ones who have taken over. Do they write it down, or do they just call them up? I mean, you know, kind of like Trump yeah, does. With yeah, the, I think they, I think they talk to their uh, local uh, congressmen. I think they talk to their local uh, uh, Democratic Party and Republican Party headquarters. I think they're probably members. They are. Many of them are super delegates. Many of them are. But the point is, yeah. it's not anything the voters can see before we go to the polls. No, you need to research it. it it's, it's nuanced. It's not like there's a list, a list of them. But there, there is a class of persons of such, because we have unprecedented wealth inequality that, that Bernie helped draw our, all of our attention to, because they have, we have this unprecedented wealth inequality that we have. Um, uh, we have given a class of citizens um, uh, influence, uh, what, what's, the, what's the term? Undue, Un undue influence uh, over our political system. And the only way we can regain it, it's simple, but it's not easy, it's just refuse to vote for people that take corporate donations or, or donor uh, donations. And the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Citizens United basically made that possible. Yeah, Citizens United removed any kind of limits. The, the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, uh, beginning with a series of cases called Buckley versus Vallejo and onward, made it easier and easier and easier to give unlimited sums of money. And the way they got around it, the way those special interest groups got around it is they say, well, we're not giving it to the candidate, we'll give it to the PAC, and then the PAC uh, will spend the money as they see fit. And the Supreme Court says, money is speech. If we constrain your ability to spend money, we constrain your free speech, and therefore you donate as much money as you want. So that's the essence. That's my understanding of the essence of, of Citizens United. Buckley versus Rush, Vallejo. Hey, you had three questions. Vallejo versus Buckley. I'm, I'm sorry. Rush Limbaugh spell, says spell that. Uh, wait, wait a second. I'm Rush, to, well, you had three questions. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to get. Rush Limbaugh says. Okay. Rush Limbaugh says that, Rush Limbaugh says please, that Hillary Vallejo? is going to run for uh, a presidential Thanks. candidate. Yeah. Uh, uh, what do you think about that? <laughs> because there's no one else I think I'm standard. not going to vote for it. That's what I think. Of. That's all I have to think about. No, I, I'm not going to vote for it. That's what I think. But, but I don't know that, I don't know. She, she could run as an independent, yeah. No, she's going to be as, as a Democrat because there's no one outstanding in that. Well, as long, she get, as long as she gets started by the primaries, yeah. I mean, the, 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 until the primaries start, there is no um, legal constraints on her on her running. I saw it on TV the other day. She's coming out now. I think, I think Rush might be trying to uh, energize his, his uh, constituency saying that. I mean, Charlie? If you play it again, I somewhat missed it. The people that use the improper portion of their brain when that's forming opinions. It's your limbic. That's your L I M B I C. That's your limbic system. So is that like libertarian? Well, you get so mad. No, it's just it's just it's just letting your emotions. It's just a ten dollar word from uh, people that say right. It's just letting your emotions okay. gradually. And I think that mass media does a real good job. And there's people who get paid a lot of money, nice six figure salaries to learn how to manipulate people's emotions and say this is really 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 good and this is really really bad and that's how you should feel about it and I think that if you look strategically you see that the difference in the domestic conduct political economy over the last four years there's barely a nickels difference between 
the Democrats and the Republicans. And with all respect, and I love, I love, uh, like you say, the Wagner Act did a lot of good things, uh, or people did a lot of good things working through the Democrats. But I think if you look over the past 40 years, you really have been subjected to a kind of Greek mask uh, theater uh, that plays to these two, two, uh, two split. They led the 41, the 4951 split serves the elites. And it doesn't serve the people. And we need to recognize, again, however you envision a Trump voter, whether it's gun owner, pickup truck, whatever it is, and he's chewing a little skull, he's got some of the tobacco stuff in his cheek. However you envision those people, you need to embrace those people because we need them. If we're ever going to get rid of this oligarch, uh, surveillance state, a permanent war state, Permanent surveillance state and a, a loss of freedom and and financial uh, security. If we're ever going to get rid of that, we have to embrace people that are not like us. Yeah, hi. yeah. You applauded my idea of the running as a Republican, and I would think that I wish you would run with me as a Republican because it's very hard. You, you do seem like more of a, re a traditional, honest Republican that could appeal to that that Trump. It's the you know. party of Lincoln. Right, exactly. So we could <laughs> we could run as honest Republicans, and but it's hard to do alone. Really, maybe the well, one see, person. See the but thing, I think we. Could I don't know how the back. Republicans would feel about me running as a candidate. What, what happens? <laughs> we'll do it together. Well, I'll, I'll tell you another story about that. You remember yeah. Bruce Rauner? He's yeah. terrific, right? We love Ron, right? We so, need Jeffersonian so, Republicans, Lincoln Republicans. So, so, Rauner's a great guy, and he's got some money. You think so? And there's a there's a little uh, there's a little enclave of Green Party people in Southern Illinois because of SCIU and the relatively liberal uh, atmosphere of Carbondale, and a guy who I dearly love, Rich Whitney. As a lawyer from Carbondale, he ran for governor. He got 11 percent of the vote, and that scared the bejesus out of the Democrats, and they made sure to cheat him for that. Mm -hmm. So any, anybody that thinks themselves a leftist and a Democrat, right there, you're signing your own death warrant because all they do is cheat you instead. Well, you know, well there's dirty let me, let, on both let, sides. Let me finish. Let me finish. Mm -hmm. So because there's a Green Party in Southern Illinois, and it, it was established in several representative districts. Rounder fabricated a Green Party candidate in the Green Party primary in Southern Illinois and ran somebody as a Green to split the left and to help elect a Republican. So that was the type of strategic thinking of yours that I was applauding that you would run as, as a Republican because it's easier in the train run. And the no, reason, to be a Trojan horse. To be a to, Trojan horse, yeah. To but, make them honest. Yeah, because the, what happens is to run for, for governor, for example, so as a Democrat or Republican, you only need, and this off the top of my head, this could be closer to that, you maybe need 2,500 signatures or 5,000 signatures. To run as a Green or an Independent, you need 25,000 signatures to run for governor. So we're working to change the ballot access laws. We're working to, uh, that is a place where lawyers can help. But you can't rely on lawyers. You can't rely on these political guy. You can't re rely on JB. You know, JB's going to tax the rich. I haven't heard anything about that. Anybody know what's going on? But I support JB taxing the rich. That's fine. Um, I, 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 I will continue to vote for Democrats that are not corporate dominated. But doesn't it we're, split the Democrats? It does split the Democrats, basically. It kind of serves the Republicans' interest by doing that. Democrats split themselves. Democrats split themselves. Split because the they decided we're going to have um, a corporate wing. And they ran with that. So I didn't split them. They, they split didn't, me. I didn't, they I didn't desert them, them. They deserted me. The, the like same the elites. elites. Oh, yeah. Split them, Rahm Emanuel and the state of Israel, and yeah. split them basically, the same, same deep state elites. Israel's a very important topic. Israel-Palestine is a very important topic. It's one that I look at and I say, I 
I can't I can't live with this. What about 9/11? Would you ever put that on the platform? I think we're getting far afield there. I don't know. No, you're not. We need to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. say, not if there's anybody else. Another question. We're we're going to wrap it up in a couple minutes and go into the bottle. So. Any number of the 100 U.S. senators? You know what percentage of them are millionaires? Almost all. My, my favorite. Um, my favorite stat that I do know is that Bernie is the third poorest United States senator. He's a millionaire, but yeah, mm -hmm. a million dollars is what it used to be. Yeah. So you would say well, that's about all of them. Bernie's got a home he lives in in Burlington. He's got another little uh, guest house where his grandkids come to visit on some island in the lake there, whatever that. What's that lake in uh, Vermont? Champlain. It's a border between Champlain, Champlain Lake Champlain. He's got some some little thing on Island. Or, um, he's the third poorest person in the United States. So. Thank you. Hillary's got 150 million, roughly. That's her little. How could we help Bernie? <laughs> when? How much? Did... Knock on doors, phone bank. Go to go to the uh, place of phone bank. But again, Bernie's a um, uh, something that, something that I will support, but. Even more so, I have to work toward giving our leaders a space, and that space can't be in the Democratic Party because they'll be eaten up by the super delegates, the donor class, and the, the party system, which stifles any kind of uh, uh, any kind of uh, give and take on the left. They're, they're really as great or greater enemies to the left. Then the Republicans, as I was telling Charlie before the speech, I'd rather be stabbed in the front by a Republican than stabbed in the back by a Democrat because I can at least defend myself if I see somebody coming from the front. Someone stabs me in the back, I'm, I'm dead. What do you think about the fascists or the CIA? Do you think there's an influence there? I got a call on this gentleman, man. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, do, do you think this impeachment will hurt the Democrats? Absolutely. <laughs> it's a distraction, it's a, it's a disservice. We have 40% of our people in poverty. We have um, 30 million people uninsured. And we're talking about who's more corrupt, Joe Biden's son or Trump. It is a distraction. It is to avoid substantive governance. We talked about Russia for the last two years to avoid substantive governance. And now we're going to delay it another two years and talk about Ukraine. And who's dirtier, Biden's son uh, working for the uh, Russian uh, oligarch, or Ukrainian oligarch. If you look at the transcript, did anybody look at a transcript on Ukraine? And did you see the part that was all redacted? Anybody notice that? A lot of it was redacted. You know what was redacted? All the bad stuff about the Democrats. Yeah. All the That's bad stuff that was talking about. about the Republicans leaked it. Yeah. Uh, all the bad yeah. stuff about the Democrats was redacted. Yeah. And they just, they made it like the whole phone call was about Joe yeah. Biden's yeah. son. But the whole phone call wasn't about Joe Biden's son. The phone call was about an outfit called CrowdStrike. And that was the outfit that examined Hillary Clinton's computer. And they never let the FBI examine Hillary Clinton's computer. So anything they say about DNC hack leak, whatever, it's all, it can't, it can't be substantiated because the FBI never investigated it. So um, they are both irredeemably, irreparably corrupt, and we gotta, we gotta man up or lady up, and uh, and, and, and and leave them in the dust because uh, it's a survival thing. It's not, a, it's not an option. Okay. It's not just a good idea. Tim, most important question of the night: Cubs fan or Sox fan? Oh, 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 I'm born, I'm born on, on the north side. I have no choice. Oh. It's immutable. It's an immutable uh, uh, character. Uh, well, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Andy is, uh, Andy's uh, nature called Andy real quick. And now that there's no more questions, I'd like to know how many people have rebuttals for tonight. There's, there's, there's got to be more than three. Raise your hand if you got something to say. We got plenty of time. We got stuff to do. Um, we'll leave the. Uh, I'll be moving the computer. Uh, okay. Come on, you guys. Let's have a hand. So who's going to speak tonight? I know there'll be more. All right. What we'll do is we'll go uh, roughly six minutes each tonight. We'll make it a generous. Uh, 
little bit of time. Uh, I'll keep. I'll run a clock on the uh, on the uh, screen, and uh, let's get going with the rebuttals. Come on. All right. Watch yourself, Dave. Watch yourself, please. My name is Raj Patel, and I speak for my. He's a brain. Que sera sera. That is, that is the reality. You know, it's not going to change. I mean, we are not going to decide. Country is doing good. I'm not as much down as you guys are. And I understand the, the uninsured. But they are not dying on the streets. They still get made to hospital somehow. You know, it is, it is not as bad. And look, what is bad is that, that we do not have no black, no Hispanic here. How is that? We are Democrats, and why come they are not, they are a big part of the party now? You know, if they say no, our candidate cannot go. Candidate cannot win. If black say we are not going, we don't like that guy you nominated. You're over, you're done. Right? The, the, and what I heard talk here, that we can talk about winning, that what issues are there, how, what is our strategy? What knowledge we have? And do you know something? If you, if I, when I look outside, okay, for, 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 for a record, let me, let me tell you, I have done everything to life. I haven't gone to labor, I labor union, I was in U.S. State labor union. Or driving cab, I was a part of the labor union. Okay, I have driven a cab, I have sold on the street, I, I, I have washed dishes, I have worked in a casino, you know, I have done all those things. And, and my, when I see this, and I have traveled this country, you know, by hitchhiking or by car or by bus or everything, and I know this country pretty well. And do you know something? There is lots of resilience, lots of hope in this country. People are hopeful people here. People are say, hey, we'll do it. But they don't, they don't say that, hey, everybody is bad. When I, I feel the whole world is bad, then I go to I go to corner and sit down and, and and think about me where I am bad and I find lots of things that are bad in me okay and everybody is bad I mean, the the idea idea that you find out this bad this bad this bad this bad I mean that's what they do on a, on a social media all the time so it doesn't doesn't take me anywhere if everybody everybody I know and everybody does anything it's bad. Where did you take me? Nowhere. I have nobody to say, hey guy, you know, to let me help me cross the street. Because they're all bad. And all the, all will, will maybe all the, all of them will throw me under the bus or something, car. You see, I don't think we are gonna solve a problem like that. I'm sorry. But uh, what what you say did it's not an invitation to your party. It is it is a kind of a what do you call it? It's just you are asking, you are crying, and say, come help, cry with me. And I don't, I don't think that's, that's the way you create an organization or company or party. Of course, you, learn, you, you work for union and, and you, are, you are a pro-union guy like Charlie, okay? And uh, hey, there is, there is no money. I mean, I mean everybody, everybody, one candidate, come out with a, a whole deal of thing and money. But where is money? Where is the money going to pay from? Somebody has to. Somebody has to give you money to do a free education or a free medicine. You got to. Somebody has to give you money. Yeah. If they don't give you money, what is a big deal? I mean, as 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 uh, that German woman I, I met several years ago. He said, I, "When I get married to my husband, I told him one thing. He said, hey, when you I marry you, I'll make baby for you.'" I'll cook, clean, and maintain a house for you, but you will work and you bring money home and you do it. Yeah. Okay? That, that, is a, that is a best lesson I never learned. That everybody who wants to spend money, you say, hey, give me the money first and then talk. You want free education? Put the money on the table, give you a free education. But if you do not if you do not do that, okay, a second another thing I'm gonna talk about. Why Trump <coughs> Trump did not spend lots of his money. He did not require a billion dollars like Obama. Okay, and he won. 
chasing its tail, whereby uh, there's got to be a raise in minimum wage, and then there's got to be raises in everything else, and then it's raises in the minimum wage, and 
it just keeps going like that with a dog chasing, like a dog chasing its tail. Yeah, make them 10 cents an hour. Uh, will you shut up, please? <laughs> please, I'm talking. Shut your mouth. Penny an hour. Just shut up. That's what you're saying. Okay, Dave. Please well, just don't shout into the mic, okay? The, the point is that <laughs> what is the point? this gets more and more ridiculous as it goes. We need a more realistic economy, and that's all there is to it. So I think that uh, what our speaker was saying, where he's uh, suggesting a $15 an hour uh, wage, then all he's really saying is that as time goes by, it'll be more and more and more. And all this really is, is a thinly disguised plan to destroy the value of our money. Thank you. Yeah, you're so right to it. You're trying to destroy our money. Just you can see that screen. Hi, um, thank you so much. I really uh, agree with everything you said um, in many ways, except for, I guess, unfortunately, the idea that it's going to work in terms of saving the planet and, uh, you know, democracy as we know it. Uh, yeah, my name's Ellen Corley, by the way. I, um, you know, I have tried running for mayor, alderman, uh, and I wish I could run for president as a Republican because it, I mean, it sounds horrifying, really, because I'm an adult child of a Republican family, and I, I have, uh, you know, my whole life kind of suffered from, uh, a Georgia family that, uh, you know, loved sent me books on Rush Limbaugh and, um, you know, a, another side that was Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman friends, and, and I, you know, love it. My family would go along with it, but, um, and not until I really experienced the, the violation, the uh, reality that Ayn Rand's theory of supply and demand is really kind of a big lie, just as um, Milton Friedman's ideas and Alan Greenspan's ideas. So on the left and the right, uh, unfortunately it seems the left or the right will say that Ayn Rand's ideas, my stepfather managed her books with Oppenheimer, you know, um, in New York, he, you know, and is part of these elites. And, you know, as much neoliberal, neoconservative, straight out of Israel to the extent that they took all our family's money uh, by a right wing, uh, she was the Lieutenant Governor of New York who was who wrote the, their propaganda campaign was to write in the New Republic that if Hillary's health care plan went in, the, it would be the end of private health care. There'd be no more private doctors. You know, this underhanded, uh, placing little um, <coughs> false flag um, things, propaganda lies in the media as a way of, of you know, making it like all liberals are, um, you know, communists. It, it goes back to, you know, to McCarthy and Cohn and these are right-wing, counter-revolutionary, fascist, Republican, and corrupt Democratic techniques. And it's ironic that what, what I get today, why do I come to these things, you know? Um, because free speech like this is not going to solve our problem. Um, a third party will actually plays right into their strategy. Uh, it's a divide and conquer strategy that's been in place since the end of World War II and the Cold War, 1948, which was 1984, as Orwell was writing about it. The CIA infiltrated the, C with the National Security Act of 1948 was written. We didn't
can have secret intelligence, covert operations like the CIA or the NSA, which is it operates in America through Carl Schmidt on the Republican side, or through the Kissinger or Brzezinski. No matter what, what we're getting is war. What I'm for, like you are, is peace. But right now, we don't have an option. And I wish that, you know, I think we're just dividing and conquering by if we have a third party. Um, the Republicans that took over my family, stole all the money, you know, would do the 4951 with their statistics. It's called choice theory, right? They could test every single person and, and divide every locale, every state, down to the, the minute. And, and believe me, it keeps moving right, right, right wing toward more war, right? And so we have to get really smart because I disagree that the, um, as you say, the world isn't going to end in four years. I actually think that it will, you know. Um, I think we've only got this last chance because of climate change. It has to be addressed now with truth. We have to have the right to a truth regulated uh, decision making from the top by non corrupt actors. Right now, it is horrifying that these, oh boy, that these non-issues like Ukraine and they focus it on the small non-issue, and you know, meanwhile, uh, we're waging war on Iran, and they just bombed, you know, the Tigris River, and that, you know, it's it's so scary, and it does get my limbic brain going. And so what I do is try to be an investigative journalist that is, you know, you, you just pick up the rock and it is on both sides. Uh, the politics have to get out of have policy. That's why I agree with a beautifully written website and I'm going to use it. I've never seen it written so well. Um, and it, you know, it, yeah. it's just, where, how are we going to get there? But just one thing that I think is interesting, I know time's up. I look up Buckley versus Vallejo. James Buckley brought that about. I never. James Buckley is a C, you know CIA agent that Time. was with um, Rob, you know William Buckley's brother, and so they manufacture these lawsuits so they can bring about these things. So we have to put our legal minds together. So thank you. Thank you. Better Trump should win than our Democrat. No. It's like saying in Nazi Germany as many as the leftists of that era did, well, better Hitler should get in there than uh, one of our opponents. And look what happened. And I think that's what we're heading for here in this country. And that's really all I came up here to say. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I want to thank our speaker for an interesting talk and giving us some ideas and things to uh, think about. On the social <laughs> side, uh, people want to have Medicare for all, they want to have a free school, a whole bunch of other things. But what happens when the people with like money you, run out of money? <laughs> the speaker? Um, and the again, to change email, people, you don't somewhere. change them from the outside. You have to change them from the inside. You have to change their hearts. And if you don't do that, nothing else is going to do any good. You think what we've experienced so far is uh, pretty bad and going downhill. Uh, climate change, 
How much of that is man and how much of that is nature? All right, let's get our speakers so we can hear them, please. Maybe 1% is due to mankind, but 99% is due to uh, natural cycles. You've had cold spells and hot spells over the years. Sometimes a lot more change in temperature than what we've had today. Uh, you think the world is in bad shape? That's nothing compared to what's coming. What we are experiencing so far is a Sunday school picnic. Wait until you experience the horrors of Revelation. Thank you. All right, next rebutter, please. Andy, you can Next rebutter, please. Who's up? Okay, Andy. I'll say a few words. said, Andy, there's a clock here. You can see it. Four minutes. No, we're going six. Don't worry, we're good. Okay. Why does it say in the Bible, don't destroy the earth? Why do they leave that community? Charlie, please. One pool at a time. One pool at a time, please. that you're asking back there. Various religions in the past have said the end times are coming. They've been wrong every single time up until now. Bertrand Russell, uh, around 1910, is a mathematician. He said, you get the top 100 religious leaders in one room. They're all, they all have a different view. They all think their way is the one way, you don't have one a penny, do you? pure way to God. He would say to them, one of you may be right, but I can tell you flat out, 99 of you are wrong. And this is the problem with belief. If you want to look up a really good article, the title of it is called A Disneyland of Militant Ignorance. It's written in 2007 by Phil Rockstrow and started out in Smirking Chimp. We live in a Disneyland of militant ignorance. Americans are, Order, divided. Please. Americans are divided between people who know the facts of who and what Donald Trump is and people that don't know. We're divided just exactly like some big Catholic churches were once divided between people who know about the pedophile priest and the people that didn't. Now, try to take a, um, take a survey among your friends. All of your friends, relatives, ask, see if you can find anybody that thinks the Catholic priests, the pedophiles, are doing a good job educating the kids on sex. I haven't been able to find any. I think, I think we're 99%. The question I was asking was, does anybody here support child abuse? Raise your hands. Who thinks child abuse, abusing good little kids, is a good thing? Well, we've got a president that thinks it's absolutely okay to have young kids ripped away from their parents and thrown in cages in concentration camps. An article that showed up two days ago in Common Dreams again said, Democrats and everybody else should stop looking for the smoking gun that you can uh, remove Trump with. Just stop looking for a smoking gun. Trump is the smoking gun. <laughs> One, one author said, we don't have a president. We have uh, a person that's masquerading as our commander-in-chief, and what he is is a bloated, bloviating, two-legged, toxic waste dump. <laughs> and that's the kindest thing I've heard said about him. <laughs> Trump is number one in two categories, and this is real. He, he's number one in having the most outrageous qualifications, 10 or 15 different things, any one of which should have chucked him out of office within a week. And he's number one in having zero, zero qualifications of the minimum quali qualification you need to be even a halfway decent, lukewarm president. The rest of the world is looking at us. They're saying, you know, we're not looking at Trump anymore. We're, they're looking at us saying, what the hell are you people thinking? Why, you know, why, as a nation, why do we tolerate this? I say, you know, 
I'm wondering when our nation, if ever, is going to get to what I call the French moment. They just put up guillotines and they grab people and start yeah. cutting heads on them. They said, we're not paying for you to be in prison for the rest of your life. Well, when you speak of the donor class, it's language matters. The donor class is not donors that are donating for all kinds of good things. These are billionaire predator pimps, and they run a stable. They run a stable. They run a stable of intellectual prostitutes in the Senate and the Congress. Our senators and congressmen are giving ordinary women prostitutes a bad name. I mean, they're, 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 yeah, look it up in the dictionary. There's two definitions. The other definition is you take money and do evil things. That, we have three people are doing an excellent job. Donald Trump is showing us an example of what the doctors in 1983 called insanity on the hoof, prime beef, as it were. People are so far out of touch with reality. That's when they were teaching uh, nuclear war is winnable as long as we strike first. And we'll get a whole new planet when Jesus returns, but this one has to be destroyed first. My, I had a landlord, landlady, that wanted to evict us in 1987 because we were doing solar research and working for world peace. She says, you're opposed to nuclear war? You're a tool of the devil. I want you out of my property. Yeah, I mean, and this, that shit was insane back then. And many of the Trump supporters believe that stuff. They're living in such a bubble, bubble of terrifying ignorance that's spewed out every day over hate radio. I mean, just listen to a 560 AM or 89 with Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and some of the others. You know, any thinking, sentient person that knows what's going on can only tolerate about, you know, five or ten minutes of that. It's just corrosive. And the number one elephant in the room that nobody seemed to mention tonight is what the, the wild card is, the kids that are coming out of school in larger, larger numbers. And you notice they don't, these kids don't belong to any political party. They're working, at the, working with the one report that says we got until 2030 to stop burning a lot of fossil fuel or it's going to be a big snowball rolling downhill that we can't do anything about after 2030. That's when the window of opportunity closes for the human race. But see, that's not ordained by God. That's our doing. See, when your house is burning down, you don't talk about uh, redoing the fall paper in the bathroom. Right now, our house is burning down. I'm all for having another party okay, with good people. But Andy. we have to work okay. within the system right now. Okay. And we got some good people running for office. Okay. Okay. So thank you all. All right, next, please. We got uh, six minutes, but you, you know what I mean. Um, the, uh, my personal opinion, a lot of people are complaining about Trump. Uh, I agree with a lot of those complaints. And I think people have a right to vent. They have a right to complain about it. Uh, but I think there's also the question of uh, uh, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about getting Trump out of office? What are we going to do about uh, taking control from uh, the uh, corporate uh, lackeys in Congress? And uh, there are a couple things I want to point out. Um, maybe a lot of you already know this. If you do, I apologize. Uh, uh, you can impeach Trump. You can spend all the time you want on trying to impeach Trump. But the, the way the process works, impeachment doesn't mean he's removed from office. Impeachment's just the equivalent, I mean, uh, legislative equivalent of being indicted. Okay, and uh, how you remove him from office is you send him in the, the, uh, the Senate. The Senate decides, two-thirds vote. And as most of us I probably know, that's never going to happen. Right. So, uh, you know, you can investigate him as great. Get it all out in the sunlight. But don't, don't hold your breath that he's going to get kicked out of office. So, so I think that the, the, the alternate is um, to complaining is, uh, or, or the next step after complaining is how do you get him out of office? And you really have to unite behind a candidate. And, uh, and I think everybody's going to have to make a really tough call, okay? You're going to you're gonna have to hold your nose and vote for somebody you don't like, or not. <laughs> That's it. It's, it's that simple. Um, you know, uh, 
you just, uh, you're probably, or a lot of people probably aren't going to be happy with uh, the candidate that's, uh, that uh, wins the Democratic nomination. But, uh, you know, it, from a practical standpoint, you're going to either have to hold your nose and vote for that person or not. So, uh, best of luck with your decision. Okay. Charlie, I know you got something to say. Charlie! All right. I know all you right. got something to say. Yeah, I've got to resolve all these issues. We got <laughs> I haven't heard anything except for the, the part of your brain that you guys are using. That 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 was awakening to me. I I figured out well, how you have all those opinions you do. But anyhow, let's thank our speaker, uh, thank you, your companion, thank you for your effort and your civic uh, involvement. Um, Tell us about term case, limits. Sir, I'll be eclectic as usual here. I've heard a number of topics here. First of all, the raising the minimum wage. I've heard many things as a union rep. We raise the minimum wage. We're going to, oh, we're going to have to shut down this place and move it overseas. Or we're going to have to bring in uh, automation. Uh, and this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And, and I'll tell you, you know, why don't you, but then, you know, the fact of the matter, now the sun was tonight, this raise the minimum wage, it will destroy the entire U.S. economy. This is a high life, whoa, this is getting serious now. The only thing that's harmful about raising the minimum wage is that the CEO might not be able to take his family for three weeks on vacation to Jamaica. And he'd have to go for two weeks only. Or he might not be able to fill up that third garage with a new Mercedes in his house. Uh, all sorts of dire consequences are going to happen, which I uh, never do. I, amazingly enough, I uh, heard these before. Regarding scriptures, the book of Revelations, uh, with even the, the Christians and putting together the Bible or the New Testament were, were curious, debated among themselves, given the peculiar nature of those those predictions and revelations. And uh, only at the end of the day figured. So I, I'm not certain if I would put, if you want to use the expression, much faith in them. Um, regarding term limits, uh, you have to look upon it as an occupation. There's no evidence, no study on Earth, whatsoever, anywhere, on the planet that says if you're in a certain occupation for a certain period of time, and given this time frame, you are suddenly no good at it. Now that has to be, maybe in police or firemen where you have physical requirements or something like this, and no regular occupation. So if you have no basis whatsoever, for making a logical determination that I'd say if I've been in a job for 10 years, after that, I'd, as a matter of fact, this is what amazes me about it. He even said it. The longer you're in a job, the more effective you are at it. Do you know what I could do? Do you know how, I, how long it would take me, Tim? Do you know how long, if, when I started, you know, to write a brief would take me three days. Do you know how long it took me when I retired? 30 minutes. I mean, this is ridiculous and why to say you? that we're going to get rid of this guy now that he knows what he's doing and can put out more work. We're going to get rid of him. This is what you're suggesting. What's the logic to this? You're I've heard this before. I lose me here. Now, regarding the Democratic Party, I'm a yellow dog Democrat, meaning if, there's some, if I go in the vote and the choice is between a Republican and an old yellow dog, I would vote for the old yellow dog. <laughs> I'm committed to the Democratic Party, and uh, the thing is, I have to follow legislation. So, um, I, 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 I'm sorry that over the years of doing assessments of politicians, I, do, I have to give reports to the independent voters of Illinois on the Illinois delegation, and the Democrats are always positive. In my computations, they come out red, and it's one good, good scores. 
advancing all sorts of legislation, and the Republican Party is entirely in the black. I have a hard time condemning the Democratic Party. I mean that. I realize they have shortcomings, as you may say, um, but nowhere, nowhere close to the, 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 the things that the Republicans advance or, or vote for yeah. or vote against is just disturbing. And as a matter of fact, my printout, I do printouts of these, the voting things. I can, I can tell a Republican across the room on an 8 map by just because it's, it's so, they come out that bad. These, these are terrible scores, so there is a significant difference. Yes. Now, the thing that's happening here, and I plan to throw this out there just as conversation is, and this is coming up in the vote, is that the parties, at least the Democratic Party, you've got a little tension here because it's, some people are pushing it over to the left, and some people are not doing it. And that's why you might like the guy like Biden, is because he's more of a middle traditional, boring, but, and they're a little afraid of going that far to the left. Now that's what the pundit talking heads might be talking about on TV. Uh, it, the other thing is having been involved in, from the beginning, you're getting the, the Green Party off the ground and seeing it go up and down and back and forth over the years, it's really hard, and particularly in the state of Illinois, to uh, get a third party up and running and maintain it. Uh, well, it, it, it really is. And uh, actually, you want to know what the real problem was? Finding viable candidates. Because we would have them here at the college, and they were not, they were not qualified okay. people. I'm sorry. We, we would have a few, and other times we were struggling to fill the, the votes, or they were just weirdos, or, you know, people who didn't fit in traditional politics, and you come, there are a lot of them, I mean, but, I mean, their head and their hearts were generally in the right place, and they wanted change, but it's a difficult process, and yeah, the, the system's rigged against you, they're holding all the cards, uh, yeah, that poker game, that's for sure, so they don't make it easy on you. Okay. Uh, I, I must admit, Democratic Socialists uh, have, have done quite a bit. Uh, in, in tackling on the mainstream, uh, not exactly a third party, but uh, they're, they're showing some signs of moving the traditional okay. politics off the dime. Anyway, I think that's about it. Thank you very much again. Come again and sign us up, sign these guys up, you know. You know and try to use that brain, guys. You know, Speaker gets the last word. <laughs> You're limbic. That's before you start, limbic. Uh, give me a second before you start. Uh, maybe I'll. Go. Hello, is this on? Yes, it's on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of going to go backwards from the. Well, I've always been going backwards. Um, I agree with Charlie on minimum wage. Uh, we agree on that. Um, I, I agree on term limits. Let's remember they passed term limits to hold back Franklin Delano Roosevelt who gave you Social Security, unemployment compensation, workers' compensation. So that's why they passed term limits. And the last guy to support term limits real heavy in this state was Bruce Rauner. So I think that's all you need to know about term limits. Um, and I know I know everyone here is a, is a dear, compassionate person. And I think what, what you have to do and you're fighting this giant machine of this unending bombardment of corporate uh, media, corporate sponsored uh, consultants, corporate dominated uh, social science, corporate dominated legal system corporate dominated academia, and yeah, a corporate dominated intelligentsia. And they get sponsored, they get elevated, and everybody else gets ground down. The 
Because if we really could fully apprehend what the U.S. does beyond the water's edge, because everything I heard said here, it ends at the water's edge. It doesn't talk about 85,000 children that starve to death in Yemen. And the party that some of you call your party is as complicit in that as the Republicans. I don't know any other way to convey that. There's an old saying, you're entitled to your own opinion, you're not entitled to your own facts. And the fact is, we've got a war party, we've got two war parties, and we have to find a way out. And we're complicit. We're not only complicit in, in war, we're complicit in all the wealth uh, inequality, all the poverty, and I know some people like me to give them some happy talk. I get it, I get it Raj, wanted to hear some good things. Be positive. It's, hard, it, it's, it's difficult to be positive when our wages have declined. Oh, this goes to the wage, uh, gentlemen, too. Our wages have declined for 45 years, so if you're worried about the minimum wage, don't, don't worry about it. It's a, it's a sub, sub. If the minimum wage had kept pace with inflation, it would be like $33. So um, we can't let, in an increasingly global world, we can't let our compassion end at the water's edge. We can't say, we can't live in this paradigm of the two-party system. It's not in the Constitution. There's nothing enshrined in law to have two parties. A lot of parties, a lot of uh, countries have five parties. There's no problem doing it. When, um, the uh, English election just happened. It was an embarrassment to uh, help who was the last Prime Minister of uh, May? Yeah, Theresa May. Theresa May. They could not win unless they enlisted the help of a far right Protestant uh, Independence Party in Ireland. It's the only way that the, the Tories got a majority in the House of Commons. Uh. So third parties are, are, are important. They're essential. Very few things have happened uh, without them, including the election of Donald Trump and the defeat of Hillary Clinton. So we, we can't let our compassion in the water end, and we can't keep operating in this 1970s notion of, of, of right and left and of the Democrats and Republicans. Because I know you heard it a hundred times as one party with two right wings. But it's now, it is a question of survival. Um, I'm looking at my notes from the other uh, speakers. What about Jeremy Paydock? Say again? What about Jeremy Paydock? Or I should say Jeremy Corbyn, but AKA Charles Paydock. Is, is that his real name? I don't know. Jeremy change? Corbyn. Do you right. change his name? He's being funny. No, I like, Jeremy. I like Jeremy. I like Jeremy. Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn. You know, and, and, and it's funny. I want to talk about this. Okay. Barry Goldwater ran for president in 1964. That was the same year that the Democrats refused to seat black people at their convention. They refused to seat the Mississippi Freedom Party delegation at their convention, and they sent Hubert Humphrey down to calm them down, and they let one non-voting delegate sit at their convention for the Mississippi Freedom Party. And no, Raj, I'm not calling everybody bad, I'm not saying, people are good and bad, people do good things and bad things. But in 1964, Goldwater ran for president, and LBJ, and this is again the example of very early, more primitive form of media manipulation. LBJ put out a commercial little girl picking a daisy, pulling the bells off the flower, and saying, 10, 9, 8, and that turned into a big mushroom cloud. And so Barry Goldwater is going to blow up the whole world. We're going to have a nuclear war because of Barry Goldwater. Because he was tough. He was a tough guy in Vietnam. And then everybody got scared to death. All the scared people who thought they were being compassionate, and they voted for LBJ. And then LBJ proceeded to carpet bomb North Vietnam and incinerated thousands of people and did not go to the peace table. 
And so that is a story. That, that's another story of uh, Democrat betrayal. in 1964 in the whole one, and of the power of media to influence people. Yeah, it's and many people stop thinking problem. with their, uh, no stop using logic, stop thinking strategically, and think with their emotional, be persuaded by, uh, be swayed by their emotions. So, thank you so much for hearing me. I was just going to say, we have a Yahoo group, and one of the members, for Years now does nothing but bad rap the Democrats. Tim knows it. Yeah. And we get a bad anti-Democrat email every day, two or three. <laughs> and they're coming like crazy now. The Democrats are doing the worst thing by impeaching the president, and they're going to fail. And as a matter of fact, the latest one, all the Democrats, this is amazing, because of what Trump did, all the Democrats are going to jail. That was his prediction. It, it, in my opinion, it helps Trump a lot because half the country doesn't think like us. It helps Trump a lot. We've got to find another way, a strategic way to think about these things. And if I didn't say, shame on me, I'm not perfect. I do bad things, right? This is a youth movement. This MPP movement for a People's Party is overwhelmingly driven by, by young people, by the people who are enthusiastic about Bernie, by the people who did the work. So the message is you got to do the work. You can't rely on elites to do the work. You can't rely on politicians to do the work. You can't rely on attorneys to do the work. You have to do the work. It can be small in a small way. It can be one person at a time. Here I'm talking to you, and that's great. But um, it's not the point uh, to trash the Democrats. The point is to say it's outlived its usefulness as a, as a vehicle for working people. It doesn't serve the needs of working people. We need to sever our ties and go forward. And we have a lot of young people. And if, um, if in a year from now we're talking about President Sanders, that's terrific. If not, we have to be ready. And if we have a President Sanders, he's going to have 435 members of Congress. And the overall majority of them are going to be elected by corporate donors. We can't be in denial about that. We can't be in, and we can't be in denial about our foreign policy and the consequences it has for people over there. So, thanks very much. All right. Gamble the South, Andy. Yeah. Gamble the South, Andy. Gavel us out, please. All right. I can't see